that song so much but we don't really have to say come Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is present in this place amen I, I really think what is happening is the Holy Spirit God is saying come holy people I think Pastor Ryan has said that in the past couple of weeks and so we're gonna sing a few songs um, today about the holiness of God and then one is about letting our hearts be the holy ground where the presence of God can rest. So let's worship Jesus. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to learn. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song
to read a passage from Psalm right now. Psalms 107. It says, Some sat in darkness and in deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. They rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That is why he broke them with hard labor. They fell and no one was there to help them. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from distress. Amen. He led them from the darkness and deepest gloom and snapped their chains. Amen. Let them praise the Lord for his great love, for the wondrous things he has done. Is there anyone in this space and in this place that might need a little hope today? Anyone here who might need a little healing or some chains in your life to break? I can't change anything. There's not a person in this room who can change any one of us, but Jesus can change everything. Jesus is the one who can change everything. So if you need Jesus to work in your life and to work in your heart, just lift a hand, take a minute, close your eyes. We're just going to sing that for a second there. Ask Jesus to show you his glory. Yes. To reveal himself to you in the deepest places of your heart. Lord, show us your glory. church. So this morning the Lord gave me a scripture that uh, I can so easily tell myself you're not worthy enough to share it even though I know God put it on my heart for each one of you. After hearing the worship today and listening to Pastor Kylie I feel led to lead you and talk about the scripture for a second that I, I read this morning. Amen. So the scripture is out of Matthew it's when Jesus he had just been baptized and then he went into the wilderness to be tempted and then it says that he left the wilderness he went into Galilee and the prophet it talks about the prophet who Isaiah who said yes 
land of Nezubalan, the land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along Jordan. He's prophesying about Jesus. Galilee of the Gentiles, the land of people living in darkness, have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. And then Jesus, it says, it says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach the new, to preach. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. And I think a lot of times when we, when we hear the kingdom of heaven is near, we think, oh gosh, we better get right. But I think what Jesus was saying is repent, because repentance is a gift. Mm -hmm. Jesus was telling us that God is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. And we get that in in, when, in Jesus' baptism, when we look at Jesus being baptized, he went there like every other person, the Son of God, went to be baptized. It says that, that uh, John the Baptist baptized him with water, but that he later would baptize us with fire and the Holy Spirit. Yes. And how, how, does, how did he know that? Because he, the example that we get is after he was baptized, the skies opened, the heavens opened. And it says that the Holy Spirit ascended on him in the form of a dove. Ascended on him here. And as it says, Isaiah the prophet says, he said that that light went into the land of the dead. I was once in that land of the dead. He went to that yes. land of the dead yes. with light. Not, not telling people what to do. He went there with the light of God and because of that light he gave them the gift of repentance because they wanted to follow him so dear Heavenly Father God I just ask for that each person here this morning God that they would be led by the same power because it goes on to say that God or that Jesus's death on the cross and resurrection that he left us including those lost wandering in the land of the dead, the opportunity to come alive in Christ, yes. to come alive because the kingdom was within our heart, God. And I call upon that for every person here this morning. We are alive because God created us in his image. He gave us the same gift that he gave Jesus when he ascended on him from heaven. Any of you who, here who have been baptized, when you, you repented, but that's not the thing, that's the gift. When you are pulled up out of that water, you had the Holy Spirit, the, the kingdom of heaven placed in your heart. And as we walk into uh, places and we don't feel adequate, like I did this morning, I'm not good enough to get up here and share a scripture because it's kind of scary. But because of, the, because of who God is in me, he gives me strength and courage. And I pray that for each one of you, even though it's uncomfortable, that each one of us would be that light that when we walk into an area that is dark and that needs the word of God, that we are able to preach it because every one of us has the same light that Jesus did when he went into Galilee. So we love you and we thank you, God. In your son's precious name, amen. Amen. Change. James fall, fear bow here now. Jesus, you change everything. Lives here. Declare that this morning, church. I'm not sure what idol, I'm not sure what broken relationship, I'm not sure the situation, but given the worship and given the sense of God's presence, you can be seated and given that prayer, 
I just have a deep sense that God wants to do something fresh and new and transformative in our lives today. And I'm so grateful uh, that you're here this morning. And um, we've got uh, we've got a lot on the plate today, and I'm 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 thrilled to be able to guide us through our time together. Uh, I do want to start by uh, having the uh, ushers come forward. We're going to participate in a form of worship through our tithes and offerings, and so I invite you to come forward for that. And uh, let me just give a, a word of prayer over this morning's uh, giving. Father, we thank you for the capacity to give, and we thank you for the model that you've given us in your own character and nature to give. Lord, we don't have to, we get to, and there's life and joy and freedom in that. So God, I pray that you would bless the person who gives and that God, you would bless their gift that we might use it for the Jesus self-proclaimed mission to preach the good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted right here in Lane County and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. As they are passing the offering this morning, uh, I do want to draw your attention to just a couple of things. Uh, We have, uh, we're participating in uh, our our Thanksgiving meal boxes, and uh, we have an opportunity to purchase meal boxes. We're trying to purchase 40 of those. So if you are interested in that, um, it directly uh, affects uh, families that we uh, partner with at Cascade Middle School with our First Fruits Ministry and Gary McLean. And so they're going to be helping distribute those. If you would like to volunteer, not just in uh, giving towards a, a meal box, but actually volunteer towards helping distribute those, um, put it in a connect card, put it on a connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. Again, I realize the, the plates are already going by, but you can drop it in the black box in the lobby on your way out. Um, and we will uh, make sure that you, you have that opportunity to serve. I think we're looking for 15 people that uh, uh, to help along that area. And the second thing, is we have our uh, community-wide worship coming up. It's uh, all the details are in the worship folder, but there's going to be uh, probably 30 to 40 churches throughout the valley that are gathering together for our community-wide uh, worship. And I think there's a, is there a slide up there for that one? I think there's a community-wide worship slide. No, there's not? Okay, just kidding. But it's in your worship folder. There's one right there. All the details are there. So um, just want to draw your attention to those two things as we get started this morning. Uh, this, is a, uh, this, is a, this is a great day. This is the day before Veterans Day. Okay, so Veterans Day is tomorrow. And I wanted to take a moment just to acknowledge and to thank those who gave uh, some portion of their lives to help us enjoy what we do in the land that we, um, that we live in. And so uh, there's a whole host of us. You may or may not know this, but I did spend the first six years of my life post high school uh, turning wrenches on airplanes in the United States Navy. Um, and so I would imagine there's a few of us here in the room. If you are a veteran uh, of either the Navy, do we have any Navy vets in here besides myself? Anybody in the Navy? Uh, if you're in the Navy, can I get a, a, a hand somewhere? Where, where's, the, where's it at? Oh, wait, okay, sorry, sorry. I was like, I'm looking at everybody pointing, but I'm not seeing anything. Um, any, any Army vets in the house? All right, go Navy, beat Army, yes. Oh, <laughs> see what I just did there? Um, uh, anyone, uh, Air Force, we got any Air Force folks in the house? Air Force, all right, all right. Um, Marines? Do we have any Marines? Any Marines in the house? Yay! Uh, Coast Guard? Is there any Coast Guard in the house? Coast Guard? There we go. And um, you may not know this, but there is a sixth branch of service that is, is, is included in this now, and it's called Space Force. Uh, it's, it's fairly new. There might not be any... There might not be any in the room, but are there any Space Force veterans? I mean, it's brand new, so so probably not. Okay, here's what I want you to do this morning. I did this at the uh, the elementary and middle school chapels for the school. Um, veterans, if you could just put your hands in the air and leave them there for a second. Uh, veterans, hands in the air, hands in the air. What I want you to do is take 30 seconds, go to the nearest veteran, give them a high five and say thank you for your service, all right? One, two, three, go, 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 go. 30 seconds, high five, say thank you for your service.
You still have time. You still have time. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. All right, let's give them a round of applause. God bless you, men and women. It is, uh, it, is, it is because of your service that we're able to enjoy what we enjoy in this land, and I give God thanks for that. Um, I do want to take a moment, too, uh, just to speak into, um, I'm not going to take your food, Pastor Kylie, I promise. I wanted to take, I got plenty of high fives. I wanted to take a moment um, and just speak just a, a little pastoral word of encouragement to our faith family. Um, this week was a fairly large, big week uh, nationwide. I, I spoke a couple words last Sunday. Uh, if you've been around long enough, you know my heart as it relates to this pulpit, that this pulpit belongs to Jesus and not to a pastor. And and because of that reason, the primary focus and goal of this pulpit is to preach and proclaim the Word of God as best as I can understand and interpret it with the help of others. So th that's what this pulpit's for. It, it's not for leaning left or right or being a political figurehead uh, dressed in pastoral clothing. That's not my heart. That's not uh, the essence of who we are. Uh, but what I do want to speak just a word to you about is uh, I have a passion in a dream and a vision to see this faith family be that countercultural community that Jesus came to inaugurate to usher in and bring in the kingdom of God. And I want to give a quick example and illustration of what I'm talking about. The first uh, you might say kingdom community or the first church, if you will, were those 12 disciples that Jesus called. Now, in that group of 12 disciples, you had a wide range of cultural and political perspectives in that little group. You might remember a guy by the name of Simon the or Zealot, however you want to pronounce it, potato, potato, I go Zealot, Simon the Zealot. Now, why did they call him the Zealot? Because he was zealous and had big opinions and uh, was passionate about the nation of, uh, of, of Israel, was passionate about the customs and traditions and the religion of Israel, and he was zealous for that, very passionate about it. You also had included in that group of 12 a guy by the name of Matthew who also had a little nickname too, Matthew the... Matthew, the tax collector, happened to be a little bit more sympathetic to the Roman way of life. In fact, he was collecting money and taxes from his fellow Jews to support the culture and government and way of life of the Romans. And so in that little microcosm of a community of those 12 disciples, you had people on both sides of the spectrum, really zealot, nationalistic, conservative, those folks... And, and the ones who are way on the other side, uh, a, a little too friendly with the ways of the Roman world and collecting money for them. And you had everyone in between. But what's crazy and unique about that is, yes, there were some struggles relationally, because anytime you bring those types of people into the room, into the same team, there's going to be some bumping and some... Um, some uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, working off the rough edges. But the beauty of what Jesus did is that under the lordship and followership of Jesus, empowered by the Spirit of God, these very unlikely people to get along outside the kingdom began to form a family. And by God's Spirit and grace upon them, they began to transform that world and usher in the kingdom of God and lived 
as a countercultural community that says, you might be crazy, wildly divided there, but that's not our idol nor our God. We follow the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yes, I worship with somebody who's zealous for the left, and I worship with someone who's zealous for the right, but our identity is not in our politics. It's in our faith in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And under His Lordship and following Him, we can, by the grace of God, not just coexist, but form a countercultural community that ushers in the kingdom of God on earth. Can I get a good amen, somebody? So I just want to, uh, I just wanted to pastorally lay that before you this morning before we jump in. Imagine with me the big difference that little things can make in life. The big difference that little things can make in life. If you're a parent and you had like a, a child, a little, you know, knee high to a grasshopper, and they come up to you, it's an Alabama thing, I'm sorry. Uh, they come up to you and they say, I love you. <laughs> Man, oh, it just melts your heart. If, if, you, if you've had that before. When they get older, it's a little less melty, but it's still good. <laughs> Maybe perhaps you've been having a rough day or something, and somebody gives you a kind word or a smile. It's those little things that, that make a big difference in your day, or, or perhaps it's the love of a pet, uh, cats and dogs, and the way they kind of come and nuzzle up to you or plop on your lap or whatever they might. I mean, just the simple act of the, the love of a pet can, it's a small thing, but it has a big impact. Or remembering important dates of your friends or family, birthdays, anniversaries, those types of things. Or perhaps it's just as simple as saying thank you for something. The little things in life can have a huge impact. Consider this, um, if you're traveling somewhere and you're off course by one degree, like if you wanted to travel somewhere and, and you're, you're going to go from point A to point B and you, were, you started off course just by one degree, after one foot of travel, you would have missed your intended destination by just point two inches. Not very much. I mean, you, it's trivial. You'll, you'll get to the right place. After 100 yards of travel, you'd be off by 5.2 feet if you're just one degree off and you're traveling in a certain direction. Not a huge uh, distance off, but it's starting to get noticeable. Uh, let's say you're, you're traveling somewhere and you go a mile long, but you're just one degree off on your travels, you will end up 92.2 feet away from your intended destination. I'm trying to communicate to you the small thing of being one degree off during travel can have a huge impact the longer you travel. Imagine you're traveling from San Francisco to L.A., and you're still off that one degree. By the time you got to, San Francisco, to L.A., you would be off by six miles. If you're going from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., you would end up on the other side of Baltimore, 42 miles away. If you're traveling around the globe from D.C. to D.C., you're off by one degree. You'll miss your intended target by 435 miles. If you're going to get on a rocket and head to the moon, which that's becoming, you know, more accessible to us as things progress in this world. I'm excited to take a moon trip one day. But if you're on a rocket going to the moon and you're off just by one degree, you're going to end up 4,169 miles away from your intended destination. And we can keep going. I don't know why you would want to go to the sun. You wouldn't make it very close if you tried anyway. But if you did and you're one degree off, you're going to miss your intended target by 1.6 million miles, and you can take it out to the nearest star in our solar system beyond the sun, you would miss it by 441 billion miles. Over time, one mere degree consistently applied will make a huge difference. Today, as we look at the evening portion of our church-wide spiritual practices plan, uh, which we will officially begin January 1st, 2025, I urge you to consider making a one-degree change in your evening routine to more intentionally connect with God before going to bed because it's the little things consistently applied over time that make a huge difference.
With that in mind, I do want to welcome you to the second week of our uh, series called Legacy, Who Are You Becoming and What Impact Are You Leaving? We're we're answering the question, who are we becoming? And and the answer that we've come to from uh, eight months ago with conversations is we want to be and become disciples of Jesus who reorient our lives to be formed and transformed by Jesus together for the sake of others. You say, why is that? Why is that who we're becoming? Well, uh, when we are being formed and transformed by Jesus together in community for others, our spiritual lives are healthier. Our soul is healthier. Our minds are healthier. Our relationships are healthier when we are being formed by Jesus consistently. Following Jesus, empowered by His Spirit, is the most compelling, fulfilling, rewarding, satisfying, gratifying, pleasing, purpose-giving, and enjoyable way to live life. There's not even a close second. And for those of us that have tried the things of this world, and you've been down that road, you know what I'm talking about. When Jesus is forming us into His image, He is healing us from the wounds of our past. A lot of us walk around with unhealed wounds. We we, we do church things, but, but Jesus never gets beyond the surface to, to really begin to heal some of those, those things of the past. Uh, when we're being formed into the image of Jesus, He is freeing us from the idols and vices of the present. Anger and greed, materialism, anybody? We have idols and vices in our lives that when we're being formed by Jesus, He is delivering us and freeing us from those things. You might not have wounds and and baggage from the past, but it's probably likely you might have an idol or a vice in the present. And when we're being formed into His image, He is filling us, I believe this, with an overflowing hope for the, for the future. The people in the kingdom, I believe, ought to be the most optimistic people walking on planet Earth. We see the inbreaking of God's kingdom already in this world. We've read the end of the book. I hope you read the end of the book. We see where the story is concluding to. We of all people ought to be the most optimistic, hope-filled people walking on planet earth. This is who we are becoming, followers of Jesus who are being formed and transformed by Jesus, not just hearing the word. Word, but living and doing His Word and bringing as many people along with us on the journey as possible. That's who we're becoming. The second question we're asking is, what impact are we leaving? What impact are we leaving? And to answer that question, uh, I'm doing it with the framework of, uh, of our legacy offering coming up at the end of this month. Um, uh, we have, uh, this is time for the small commercial break from the sermon. Are you ready? Small commercial break from the sermon. Uh, we have an upcoming legacy offering on November 24th. And today we're going to get to, to hear the testimony or perspective of a wonderful couple, uh, maybe some of their family members, maybe just one person, who knows, we'll see what happens when they get up here. But we're going to get to hear from the perspectives of why they choose to invest financially in our church's legacy offering. Uh, but before we hear from them, uh, I do want to take a, a moment to remind us of what the legacy offering is and the impact that it's having on people's lives as we give to this. For those of you that have been around City First for a while, you're familiar with the language of faith promise. Our legacy offering is the same thing as faith promise. It just just simply has a new name and a new time. For those who are unfamiliar uh, with that terminology or any of that language, 
our legacy offering, a formerly called Faith Promise, is an annual offering and pledge Sunday where 100% of the money that we raise is given away to ministry outreach with the majority of it going to our global focused initiatives. And we have four legacy lanes, uh, four lanes of vision that we are wanting to fund for this. Uh, the first one, legacy lane number one, is our City First projects. Now, I shared this uh, last week. It, it was probably premature, and I'm still learning uh, when to share ideas with folks and how to share ideas with folks. And so if it was new, I apologize for that. Uh, I did get in contact with the DS, our district superintendent, and he's ready and waiting on a proposal of what this might look like. So there's no, there's no real plan right now. It's still vision and dream, but he's ready for a proposal from us so that the district can come behind and help fund this in partnership with City First Church. And, and so this, this this first uh, lane here is, uh, is, is a City First Church Highway 99 church plan. It's one thing to talk about the issue of homelessness in our community. It's another thing to put your money and your mouth and your action uh, to, to, to what you're saying. You, you hear me? I didn't come out as clear as I wanted to, but I think you know what I was trying to say. And so there's lots of services on hi Highway 99, but very few services are meeting the spiritual needs of those people. And so what would it look like if, by God's grace, we took Porky's Palace, remodeled that thing, and planted a Porky's Palace? I can't even believe I'm saying that. But we planted a church there. On June 5th of, of this year, earlier this year, I text uh, Pastor Kimber a random text. I said, have you ever considered planting a church for the unhoused? <laughs> she never got back to me, so I thought that was a no. Um, until a, a few months later that God was doing a work in her life and preparing her for something. Listen, there's still no actionable plans on this. It's still vision, but, but Pastor Kimber has a calling and a passion to plant a City First Church, Highway 99, right out there in the mix of it all to meet the spiritual needs of those individuals, to see lives healed, to see stomachs fed, to see demons cast out, to see past trauma healed up. There is a need for us at Kingdom of God carriers to go into that dark land, if you will, if I can use that terminology, and to be the light bearers of the kingdom there. So rather than just talking about the issue of homelessness in our community, let's try and do something about it. And so, legacy lane number one. <laughs> Legacy Lane number two, City First Next Gen. Uh, we're wanting to to fund uh, to to see ten thousand dollars raised for this. I got a placeholder for the City First Christian Academy one million dollar endowment scholarship fund. Are we going to get a million this time? Probably not. But I'm going to keep sharing the vision because I want a million dollars invested so that we make three to five percent. We can take the interest off that and give it to the school for scholarship funds. So to so to make Christian education more accessible and affordable. But until that time, I bet we could at least do a direct scholarship fund and raise $5,000 over this next 12 months so that we can hand it to the school and say, distribute this as you see need. And so I, I just I, I, wanna, I want us to raise $5,000 for City First Christian Academy, just a direct scholarship fund to say we want to bless and make Christian education more accessible and affordable for the, for the families that are coming. And so just, I, I just want to do it. I don't know. Just, I think it would be a beautiful thing. And then we also, speaking of next gym, just want to invest in the, uh, the spiritual and leadership development of the, the next generation of leaders. What you saw three weeks ago, I think it was, on the stage, I, I want to begin integrating and seeing more of that and, and not talking about our, our youth that are sitting up here on the front row as the church of tomorrow, but start giving them platform time, preaching time, worship leading time, prayer time, because it's not just a tomorrow thing, it's a today thing. And and so we want to invest. We want to invest in the spiritual and leadership development of these students. And, and Pastor Daniel has a, a plan for that. We want to help fund that. Uh, legacy lane number three, our local outreaches. We currently partner with three organizations and give uh, $6,000. I'd love to see City First Church double that donation a little more to go to 13200 We currently give... Uh, Dove Medical and One Hope, $100 a month, and the Life Change Program, $300 a month. 
I would love to see us increase our giving to Dove Medical. You can have a theological, biblical perspective on abortion, and that's great and that's good, but then there's the next step to do something about it again. So more than just having a, 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 our, our words say something about it, let's have our money and our actions do something about it because Dove Medical is doing a fantastic work in our community with women who choose to carry their baby full term. They need help. Help. The majority of women who carry their baby full term are beneath the poverty line. They need help. So if we want to, we, if we want to say we're we're not for abortion, th that's fine. That's good. And, and, and biblically, I think that's. Uh, uh, particularly correct in, in terms of elective abortions, but we need to do something to help women who carry to full term. And so I want to I want I want to increase our giving to Dove Medical. It's not much, but it's it's more than what we have been doing to One Hope to Life Change program. And I would love to add onto our our monthly giving to to community partners. I would love to see us um, giving a hundred dollars to Gary McLean and the First Fruits Ministry as a faith family to help fund that ministry. Some of you already give to that personally. I would love to see our church do it and support that ministry. And then uh, CAFA, uh, Christians as Family Advocates, they do a fantastic work in our community. They're on the cutting edge of helping people overcome hurts, habits, hangups, traumas, and, and move in a more whole, healed way with Jesus. And I would love to see us uh, come alongside and partner with them. Uh, many of you have benefited from the classes that we've held from them. I would love to see us partner with them in this way. And our fourth and final legacy lane is our global outreach, which consists of the majority of our giving and our legacy offering, uh, particularly the, the majority of it through our Nazarene Global Missions. It's through that arm of the global church of the Nazarene that our giving has a clear and direct impact on the lives of missionaries, helping fund the, them and their health insurance. It helps to fund hospitals and clinics like the one in Papua New Guinea. It, it helps provide a Christian higher education for those who God's calling in the ministry through Nazarene institutions of higher learning around the globe. And of course, we um, you may or may not know this, but we support a child development center in Malawi, Mozambique, where over uh, 50, kid, 50 to 100 kids, depending on who shows up that day, are fed physically, but also are, they're being shared the gospel, and they're being fed spiritually, and they're being educated. And so we have four really solid, fantastic lanes of vision that we're calling these legacy lanes that we want to fund this year. And uh, so our total giving, if you were to add all that up, our legacy offering goal is $75,000 this year. And um, I just say, by the grace of God, here's what I want you to do is just simply ask. There's no gimmicks. I'm not going to do emotional emotional pulls. I'm not going to do that. I just want to share vision with you. Okay, that's my commitment. No gimmicks, no emotional stuff. I just want to share vision with you, and, and then I just want to ask you to pray about it, and then just do whatever you hear and sense God asking you to do. Okay, are you with me this morning? So no gimmicks, no, no emotions, no, no, nothing, no, nothing like that. Here's the vision. Pray about it, and then let's see what God does through our faith family. You with me? All right. So with that, I want to invite uh, a, good, uh, a good friend up, Jared Brower. Can we give Jared a, uh, a round of applause as he comes up? Jared and crew. Jared and crew. Jared, would you just introduce us real quick to who all is coming with you? All right. I have my uh, three lovely daughters here. My wife is hanging out. Oh, you came alive. She's doing, doing ministry that way. But I have here uh, Paige, my middle daughter, yeah. and Madeline, my youngest, and Caitlin, my eldest. Well, thank you for, well, thank you three for coming up here with your dad. I know it's the most fun thing in the world to stand up and see all these beautiful eyes sh uh, staring back at you. Uh, Jared, I wanted to, to, to have you just share from your perspective. I, I sent you some questions this week, and so I'm just going to ask them as they are here and just uh, let you go with it. Um, I did not pre uh, screen his answer, so I have no idea what he's going to say. I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit will lead us in the right direction. Um, Jared, what inspired you and Heather to start giving uh, to the legacy offering formerly called Faith Promise? 
so I think the first thing uh, for us as a family is um, our, our own legacy that we have. Uh, my, uh, my grandparents uh, were heavily involved in church planting and just taking the, the, uh, the gospel to the people where they're at here in the United States. And uh, my wife, um, her, her grandparents actually uh, went abroad and were uh, missionaries on, uh, out in the uh, rest of the world and doing some pretty cool stuff out in the jungles. So, you know, definitely opportunities there to see what God can do here and beyond. And so for us, it's just kind of a, a continuation of that process. Very cool. Thank you. Um, what impact have you seen or do you hope to see with the contributions that you give towards Legacy Offering, formerly called Faith Promise? Uh, so we've seen, you know, obviously the, the, the monies that go towards missions uh, beyond uh, in terms of our, our friends in, in, uh, over in Malawi and Africa, um, and then obviously in other places of the world that we've uh, been, been able to, to send to friends and family even uh, out on the mission field. Uh, so that's really important. And then again, same thing here locally. I mean, how many of our, our uh, people even here today uh, uh, come from the mission um, as a part of the ministry that we're helping to be partners with? Sweet. Um, what would you say to someone considering giving to Legacy Offering for the first time this year? Um, I, I would say that first, you know, it's uh, living a lifestyle of obedience. Um, so God calls us in uh, different parts of our lives to to give in lots of different ways. And some of that is just being, you know, our own personal ministries that he calls us to. And then he also calls us to give part of what he gave to us, which is he gives us our finances um, and our talents and, and those things that he blesses us with. And so for us, it's always been a, uh, an opportunity to say, hey, God, you gave us this. And part of that is to be good stewards of our monies. And he says, hey, this is where I want you to give. Um, you know, obviously, we get fed here as a church. And so that's kind of what our ties goes towards. And then, um, you know, where else does God want us to spread the word so that others could be fed? And that's where, you know, giving, giving beyond. So you, I think you, maybe, maybe you answered that, that next question. How do you prioritize giving as a family? Is that pretty much it? Well, I'd, I'd go even yeah, further than yeah, that. Yeah. Um, you know, we the first thing we uh, we live by is to live on less than what we make. Um, if we start there, say, say that one more time. Live on less than what we make. All right, live below your means. Yes. Okay. Um, and so that gives us a lot of room then to say, where else can, does God want to go? You know, obviously, you know, investing for our future is part of that, but then also investing into what else God wants to do. And so who knows where he's going to take that. He has his own mission. and We get to partner with him in what God wants to do. And last but not least, if you could accomplish one thing through your support of legacy offering, what would it be? If you could accomplish one thing with your giving. Uh, well, actually, there's so many things that I think we do accomplish, um, but most importantly is that, you know, anybody that uh, would be blessed by what God would do, that they would come to know him, and there's so many people that need that. Amen. Um, Jared and his wife, Heather, uh, are uh, school teachers here in our, in our community, um, uh, Junction City and Eugene Christian School, and they have been and continue to be uh, a model of Jesus-focused, spirit-listening, um, obedient disciples, and I just am so thankful uh, for their... Um, it's like you guys are becoming like one of the pillars of the church kind of a thing. Like you're just a great model uh, for us to look to. So thank you so much, uh, Jared and girls. Can we just give them a round of applause say thank you? Uh, so coming up at the end of this month, uh, you have the, the, uh, the uh, legacy offering cards in your uh, uh, worship folder this morning. They're going to be in the folders for the next uh, several weeks. And so you can take those, pray about it, see how the Lord might be leading you. And uh, we, ju we just want to say, God, give us the vision. We'll trust you for the funds. And then give us the courage and the boldness to get out and do it. And so that's, that's where it gets fun is when you start seeing lives actually changed. Amen. Well, friends, uh, the American church, as you might realize, is facing a discipleship crisis. Um, we've come to that conclusion here locally, but it's not just us. That is a, that's a conversation uh, broadly throughout the American church. It's become clear that our current approaches uh, to church growth and 
and kingdom building uh, that's marked by entertainment and consumerism and high production is not really cutting it when it comes to uh, having Jesus be deeply formed in the lives of individuals. And, and, and so it's not cultivating that deep formation in Christ. Uh, a routine of worship services and, and, and sermons alone is it, it seems to be falling short in, of fostering the spiritual maturity that's needed for this profound wholeness and healing that God wants to bring in our lives. Uh, nor has this model that we've been using or accustomed to in American church culture, it, it hasn't created those um, transparent, trusted communities where people can be fully seen and known and loved as they are, allowing the Spirit of God to propel them then into greater and deeper healing and transformation. So while we've had a failing strategy of, uh, of having Jesus deeply formed in the souls of people, uh, meanwhile, the devil has had a strategy and a plan that he's been working relentlessly to keep us fractured and hollow and isolated and spiritually drained, burdened by hidden sins or resentment or despair or greed or anger or unresolved brokenness. And I just want to say to you, faith family, the path forward is clear. It's simple. It might not feel easy, but it's simple and it is clear. We must return to the spiritual practices that Jesus himself modeled because these practices granted Jesus constant access to the source of life, God the Father, through the Holy Spirit. And when he engaged in these practices, continually accessing the source of life, Jesus himself, who was made in every way like you and I, was able to, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, to live victoriously over sin and temptation and live in the hope of the kingdom of God, fulfilling the purposes for which God sent him to earth. And I just say, we can do the same. We can. We can. We don't just have to keep walking around the same circle, not making progress. There is a way forward. The path is clear. It's us engaging the same practices that enable Jesus to have constant access to the Father. We, too, can engage those same practices. Jesus engaged in fasting. I'm so excited for us to start practicing fasting, faith family. It's on the top of everybody's list. Oh, you mean fat, like not eating food? Yes, I mean not eating food. It's amazing. I don't know. The church has practiced it for 2,000 years, and Jesus did it, and it enabled him to return from his 40 days of temptation by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So anyway, I'm, ex I'm excited for us to, 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 to experiment and practice fasting, prayer, silence, solitude, scripture reading, and memorization. Jesus practiced those things, giving, serving, fellowship, and public worship. Jesus constantly was practicing these spiritual practices that enable him constant access to God the Father. The New Testament authors urge us throughout the scripture to be alert, to put on, to be sober, to be watchful, to stay awake. They call us to have a plan for our spiritual growth and victorious living, to stand firm against the devil, the world, and the flesh. The enemy has a strategy for your downfall, and you need a strategy to stand tall in your growth in Christ's likeness. And we can do it. <laughs> we can. I see it, man. I just see it. I just see it. What we're sharing over these three weeks and putting into a, a notebook format so that everybody has one of these is we're sharing a one-year training plan uh, connecting us to the source of God's glory and grace, or as I like to say, getting under the spout where the glory comes out. It's a one-year training plan that connects us to those practices 
that have been habitually proven both in Jesus' life and throughout church history that if you engage these practices consistently, you get the compounding effect of God's grace on your life. And before you know it, you've traveled a year and your life is looking radically different than it did before because you made a 1% change to allow the grace of God to trickle deep within your soul. We have this one-year training plan that we are presenting these three weeks and we'll give to you in a journal notebook format at the end of the year. I'm asking you to commit to it. And I'm asking you, as you commit, I'm I'm, I'm telling, I'm I'm speaking, I'm believing that I, I can... I can say with like, sir, I just, I'm afraid to say the word, but I'm going to say, I guarantee that if you practice these things, and and it's not a guarantee of like hype or emotionalism, it's just, I've seen the result both in my life and throughout 2,000 years and in the life of Jesus, that people who practice these things walk more confidently and bold in their identity as a son or daughter of God. They walk more healed and set free from those things of the past and the idols of the present. And they are more, they are more holy, hope-filled to be used by God in their current situations. I just, I, I guarantee that God's grace and goodness is so good and wants to touch and transform our lives that if you commit to this plan for one year, I guarantee your life will grow in the hope, healing, and wholeness of Jesus. I have no doubt about it. 2025 can be the best year of your life if it's the best spiritual year of your life. Remember, we're not simply trying to be godly. We are training to be godly, 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Training takes effort. You can't just show up and be a consumer. It takes effort. You can't just show up and get entertained with big production. It takes effort. To be godly takes effort effort. God's grace is opposed to earning. God's grace is not opposed to our effort to train to be godly. That's the command and the invitation that the authors of the New Testament give us to train to be godly. This journey is about taking off our old selfish habits and motivations, idols and vices, and putting on the way of Jesus, the person of Jesus. And that journey of putting off and putting on requires intentional work. But I want to say thanks be to God that the Holy Spirit empowers us with both the desire and the strength to do this, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Amen. 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 I love what Dallas Willard said. I ended last week's sermon with this quote, and it may have felt more like a downer. It was intended to be an upper, but it might have felt like a downer. Um, But it's just a powerful, powerful quote that I think we have to wrestle with. Uh, It's a truth, a reality that I think we need to grapple with as an individual, but also as a faith family. The single most obvious trait to those who profess Christ but do not grow into Christ's likeness is their refusal to take the, res- uh, the reasonable and time-tested measures for spiritual growth. And so I want to present to you, maybe you have a plan. Maybe you're like rocking it. You're like, bro, catch up. Like, I've been on this train for a while. Like, I, I, mean, I mean, spiritual practices, like 201, or like, I'm, I'm, I'm down, like, I'm, I'm on the train, or whoop, whoop, like, get on. And if that's you, praise God, you keep, you, you just shovel some more coal in that train, and you get the, the steam going. I mean, that's kind of an old train. I guess they're more diesel, electric, or whatever these days. But If you got a plan, keep going with your plan. But if you ain't got a plan, I'm saying, let me give you a plan, and let's all start together. Amen? And so um, there, there is a way forward. So our overall training plan consists of both individual practices uh, that we do on our own and community practices that we'll do together. So last week and this week are highlighting those uh, individual practices. Next week we'll be highlighting the community practices. And uh, so, so last week we were looking at our morning routine, and I, I hope that was helpful for you. I mean, I, I narrowed it down to minutes, like just if you got 27 to 42 minutes, we can do this. 
We can do this. If you can spare 27 to 42 minutes, I'm just talking about a small change. I'm not talking about like going to Bible college and getting a degree. I'm just, I'm just saying just a one degree change. Let's just read our Bible every day. Let's start there with a little bit of prayer. Like, like just a one degree change. So we looked last week at the morning routine. Um, this week, I want to look at our evening spiritual practices plan because I believe the best way to start your day is to end your day well. The best way to start your day is to end your day. You, do you want an extra 27 to 42 minutes to, to meet with God in spiritual practices? Then you probably should end your day a little better so that you feel more awake and alive just to wake up and engage. Can I get a good amen? So, I mean, have you ever set the alarm with the intention to get up and you hit the snooze button five times before you know it? You're rushing out the door just trying to get dressed and brush your teeth just to get out? It's a terrible way to start the day. So if we end our days well, we can begin our day well. And so I'm suggesting that maybe just if you stop scrolling just for 20 minutes. If you just turned it off just for 20 minutes, just... Just give Jesus 20 minutes of your scroll time and see what he does in the evening. And let's do that for a little while and watch. What, so just, just 20, maybe, maybe you want to be super spiritual. You want to do 25 minutes. Whatever you want to do, just <laughs> give me 20 to 25 minutes. I just want you to know God loves you, but I got a plan for your life. Is that okay? Like, I just believe that God wants to do something so real in us. And, and it, it's possible. We just got to posture ourselves with these practices and let God do what only God can do. But God can't do it unless we get under the spout where the glory comes out. So spiritual evening practices, um, is it really? T t oh, my gosh. Whoa, what happened there? Time in the kingdom goes by, like a, a minute's like an hour, and an hour's like a minute. Um, I, I, will, um, I will walk through these a little bit faster than I in, intended because I want to be mindful and respectful to the, uh, the, the, the Sunday classes and the teachers that have classes after this. So give me about seven minutes. I think I can do this. Spiritual evening practices. We're, as a church, uh, I want us to start in the evening with our scripture memory verse. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I want us as a, as a faith family to practice memorizing scripture. I'm going to give you an easy softball to begin with in January, but a little bit like, it's almost like an easy softball, but it's kind of a curveball. And so it's going to be um, jo uh, John chapter 3 verse 16. You guys familiar with it? Oh, but do you know 17? <laughs> That's where the curveball comes in. So I, I, you've already got half the memory verse memorized for January, but we're going to add verse 17 because it's powerful. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Oh, I'm so excited for that. I'm so excited for that. Um, our, uh, our other uh, 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 practice that we want to do is is called the the prayer of examine. It's uh, it, it's it's going to come out of Second uh, Corinthians chapter thirteen verse five. It's it's putting flesh to how we might do this. So Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether or not you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless of course you failed the test. <laughs> um, so examine yourself. So we're going to practice the prayer of examine. At the end of the day, after we've done our Bible memory verse, um, I want you to take just about five to ten minutes and prayerfully ref reflect on your day in light of God's presence. And I want you to ask a couple of questions. What moment today was I closest to Jesus? What moment today was I distant from Jesus? And was there a moment where I missed an opportunity to show God's love and kindness? And then we're just going to end that time of examine. We're going to do that with the Holy Spirit. Where was I closest? Where was I distant? Did I miss an opportunity to showcase the kingdom? And then we're, we're going to give God thanks for the moments of nearness. We're going to ask God forgiveness where we fell short. And we're going to ask for grace for tomorrow. Next thing I want us to do in the evening is uh, take five minutes. Just five. Just five little minutes. And uh, just create a gratitude list. Uh, three to five things that you're grateful for from Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, 
whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So we're going to train our minds to start thinking on things that are uh, praiseworthy, lovely, pure, admirable, right, and noble, and true. So we're going to say that what, what are we grateful for? Because as we begin to wind down our day, we want our minds thinking on these things here because it says then the God of peace will be with you. And finally, I want us to end our evening our evening routine with a prayer. An evening prayer motivated out of Psalm chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. This is the passion paraphrase. Bear with me. It says, May we never forget that Yahweh works wonders for every one of His devoted lovers. And this is how we know that He will answer every prayer. Tremble in awe before the Lord and do not sin against Him. Be still upon your bed and search your heart before him. Selah, or pause in his presence. Bring to Yahweh the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in him. Lord, prove them wrong when they say God can't help you. Let the light of your radiant face break through and shine upon us. The intense pleasure that you give surpasses the gladness of harvest time even more than when the harvesters gaze upon their ripened grain and when their new wine overflows. Verse 8, now because of you, Lord, I will lie down in peace and sleep comes at once. For no matter what happens, I will live unafraid. We want to surrender and cast all of our worries and burdens upon God, asking for his peace, rest, and renewal. And we're going to end our time that way. And I have, a, I have an encouragement for you that once we've worked through that evening plan, again, just engaging practices that Jesus himself engaged in, once we've worked through that evening plan, I want to encourage you that after you've done that, to avoid screens so that you can maintain a clear, thoughtful, restful, peaceful mind. So practice the routines, and then don't go back to scrolling or watching. Just go to sleep and let the Spirit of God help you as you prepare well to start your next day. Are you with me, faith family? I got a great illustration. I'll save it for next week, but it's, uh, it's beautiful. You're going to love it, I guarantee you. Um, you may be here this morning, and... Um, you're like all in for this and ready for this, and that excites my heart. But uh, it could be, too, that, that you're carrying a burden, that you're carrying something heavy, that you need the touch of Jesus to be upon your life. And so we're going to sing a song to end our time this morning. Um, the name of the song? I speak Jesus. That's right. Uh, I Speak Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we just want to take a moment to declare the name of Jesus over our personal lives, our families, whatever burden, anxiety you might be carrying, wherever you are mentally and emotionally, whatever relationships you have around you, just a moment to declare and speak the name of Jesus over all of that. So faith family, would you stand and let's end our time in worship. I just want to speak the name of Jesus.
from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the whole family, would you just receive this pastoral blessing on your way out? Jesus, may you go in peace. God bless you. Amen. Amen.